Hello? I've given in to old age. Sorry. It makes me look more intelligent than you would think. But you know. If I turn to the person the most ugly and say good morning, <laughs> any good to be in, in the church of God this morning, any good to be in God's house? Yeah. I'll ask this side. <laughs> <laughs> you think we sleep over there? Any good to be in God's house this morning? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. It really is. And like me, Nick, can I move this off the top? No? Yeah. And it's not like me to have to add a little bit of humour to the service. But it's just to stop you all falling asleep. And when I finish after, there's a 10 question test just to see you. And if you don't get out of this place, you'll have to listen to the sermon again if you get less than five, okay? So I read this the other day and it was, it, I, I, it really made me laugh. So it was a man who lived in Blanavan. And as you know, it can get quite cold. Especially in winter time, so he decided to take a holiday to Australia. And we wasn't a tennis player, and he'd had all his jabs, right? So we didn't go in there. But his wife was on a business trip, but she was scheduled to meet him there the day after. When he arrived in Australia, he thought he'd email her and let her know that he arrived okay. So he accidentally got one letter wrong in her email address and sent it to a little old lady whose pastor husband had just passed away. So you can imagine. She read the email, shrieked and fainted. The family came running into the room to see what happened. They saw the screen and read the message off their computer. It said, dearest wife, I've just checked in. Everything is prepared for your arrival. Yes. <laughs> It's absolutely scorching down here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought that was great. So let's pray before we start, please. Lord, I pray that my words this morning are pleasing to you. Everything I say is to honour you, and none of it is about me. I pray that they fall, they don't fall on barren ground, and everyone leaves this service in a better place than when they came in. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So, I felt the need to speak about one of my favourite passages. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a Bible story and, and it's in Luke 15. So those who've got your Bibles, turn to Luke 15. Those who haven't, why? I know we're in the modern age and we've all got our mobile phones and we've got the app on the phone as well. But anyway, Luke 15, let me know when you're there, please. The reason I've chose this is because Luke 15 is three stories and one of them being the prodigal son. And it's a, it's a story that's really close to my heart um, because it's a story that I heard the week before I got saved. The, the, the thing about it was that Maxine had gone to church with Suzanne, then we were in Victory Church in Cumbran. And as I've said before, I'm not going to give my testimony today, but she, she said to me, you've got to get down this church, you won't believe it. She said, we walked in and it was a stage and it was like a unit factory and everybody was all jumping around. There was a woman with a tambourine and there was <laughs> blinking, what do you call it, ribbons going everywhere. And he, she said, honestly, she said, he wouldn't think you were in church. She said, not what we expect. And the secular world and everybody that is outside that door, they expect us to be whitewashed walls, cold pills, navel gazing, say the odd amen, and then go on, froze. And if that's how it was, and I guess how it is in every church, then you'll never ever see me in a church again. Because we all know that there's more to it than that. We don't want that. We want it to be upbeat. We want to come here and actually enjoy ourselves. Even laugh. From time to time you can do it. Cry. This is what this place is all about. So, 
as I said, the, the prodigal son spoke to me because Maxine went to church the week before me and I could see that it made a big difference to her. I could see that, that it, it, it was like somebody had switched the light on because at the time we were going through a lot of stuff and our, our oldest son was heavily involved with um, cocaine, MCAT, going out, you name it. And the sad thing about it is that there's hundreds of youngsters, even in this little town of Blanavan, that's doing exactly the same even today. And it's just, it's just such a terrible thing. And for, a, for family and friends of people and young people like that, it's heartbreaking because you can't fix them. They've got to want to do it themselves. I was a retained firefighter at the time, so I wasn't drinking because Friday night, Saturday night, I could have had a call at any time, and I was going into the pubs in Vermont at three in the morning sometimes and getting my son out. So we were totally broken. But the following weekend after Maxine went with Sue, um, we'd had a decent fall of snow for a change, and we couldn't get to church, so. Victory Church Combran put a, a video podcast up for the benefit of those who couldn't get to church but they wanted to listen to a sermon. So the, the pastor at the time played this video, a, a video of himself talking about the prodigal son. And when he when he was talking about this this father whose son went out and spent all his money and his inheritance his father's inheritance and went out and spent it on well living and just doing crazy things. I just think like, well, that's, that's like me. But that's, that's the same sort of story as my son. And perhaps I'm being a bit too soft and I'm loving him in every time. And every time I'm doing it, he's going out the following week or the following day even and doing exactly the same thing again. But the, the prodigal son story is a, is a story that really spoke to me which was enough to make me want to go to church the following week, just to have a little look and see what it's all about. So that's why I've chosen this one. So as we go through the Gospels, we see Jesus explain things by using parables, little stories, to help us understand uh, exactly what Jesus and what God wants. He uses these stories to help us understand God's kingdom and our relationship with him. And he tries to put it in that way so that us simple people can understand exactly what he's trying to tell us. So for those of you who don't know, prodigal means spending money or using resources freely and recklessly, wastefully, just wasting what you've got. And I think if we all have our answer, we're all guilty of that on time, yeah? So my son's story was a little bit like a modern day prodigal son. And I think that we've, we've all seen that as well. Not just, not just me personally, but we all know someone who has seen it happening and seen it still going on today. So people used to think, they probably still do, thought they just thought I was mad. And they used to say like, why do you still keep wanting him to come home? Why was my arm still open? Why do I keep, use a valley word, cutting him in? Why do I keep wanting to do that? Why don't you just get rid of him, push him away, he's no good to you? But love, that's the reason why. Just come home. I mean, me and Maxine used to cry ourselves to sleep, thinking, just say it now, just come home. But there we are. If you've got your Bibles, as I said, Luke 15 um, is probably one of the best known parables, the prodigal son. And it's one of three. So prodigal son is where the son gets his father's inheritance, tells him I want your money, and then he goes away and he goes to a different land and he just wastes it all. And then after a while he realizes, after all this crazy living, this ain't no good. I'm better off even going back as a servant to my father, if he'll allow me back, than carrying on like this because he'd wasted it all and he was in quite a mess. 
In Luke 15, this is one of three stories. Jesus is sharing these stories to the same audience, but there's two different types of people in the audience. The parable of the lost sheep is where the shepherd goes away, and we've all heard this one. He leaves the 99 and he goes looking for the one. And when he finds the one, he's ecstatic. This parable ends like this. In verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Then it goes on to the parable of the lost coin. A woman has 10 coins and loses one. Does this sound like losing a penny or something small in value? That reminds me, I found a tenner the other day. Tenner was. No, I mean, it was great. And I was really, really excited about it. But this coin that this woman found was more like a day's wages, perhaps like near a hundred pounds than a tenner. If I'd lost that, I'd be gutted. And if Maxine knew about it, she'd make sure I was. <laughs> <laughs> the woman in the story found it and she was ecstatic. And this is how it ends in verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels, the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus goes straight into the parable of the prodigal son. I think it's important for us to understand how this begins, because as I said earlier, in the very beginning, Jesus is talking to specific people. Verse 1 it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus is telling these three stories in a row to two types of people. First was the sinners and the tax collectors who were just desperate to hear Jesus, Jesus and learn from him. And then a bunch of critics who stand back and they judge. So after the lost sheep and the coin, we get to the prodigal son. And it's one of those stories that as we dive deeper, all of a sudden, more things come alive. And we see more things in a different kind of light. It's a story of a son, as I said earlier, doing the unthinkable. He comes to his dad and says, I know you're healthy, dad, but I want my inheritance and I want it now. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but when some people come together when parents die, the inheritance money brings up the worst in people. Ever seen that? I think a lot of us have heard of it. This happens. But this is even worse than that. This is a younger son coming up and saying to his dad, you were dead to me, or oh, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. So the dad gives him his inheritance, and in verse 13 it says, um, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. As I explained earlier, spend it extravagantly or wastefully. We all know someone like that, as I said. We've all done it ourselves. Most of the people Jesus was talking to at the time were Jewish. The chosen people. They were the set-apart people. These were meant to keep together. And yet the boy disowned his own people. He sold out all his values and morals and he was a total disgrace. In verses 14 to 16 it said, But when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his pig's fields to feed the pigs. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But feeding pigs and a great job, right? But for a Jew, it was a disgrace. It's wrong. Pigs are off limit, they're unclean. So he'd become unclean. 
If you're a Jew, you don't eat pigs. Touch pigs, have pigs as pets, eat pigs food. Which is why this guy was, um, was dreaming about it. This boy had become this prodigal. He's become this wasteful, worthless squanderer. Everybody saw that in him, but not his dad. Because you see, the story goes on. Now we get to the real meaning of the truth. This is the real meaning of the story, actually. There are two audiences here. And Jesus is speaking to both. First, he speaks to the sinners and tax collectors, you and me. And he talks about a guy who's in a mess. This prodigal who becomes broken and repentant. He's sitting there in the pig field, realizing that his dad's servants are much better off than he is right now. So broken, he thinks that maybe, just maybe, if I go back and I'm really, really sorry, my dad will hear that sorrow, sorrow and he can see past the disrespect and the disgrace that I've become and he'll hire me back as a servant. But in verse 20 it says, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And what we have to understand, that in that day, the first century Jew, if you were an accomplished man, you didn't run. You wouldn't be caught dead running. In Jewish culture, it was a total disgrace, a total loss of dignity, if you did it. But the dad, he didn't care. The past didn't matter, his son is what mattered. In verse 21, it says, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Totally broken. But his dad, he hardly cared about the words. He saw his demeanor, demeanor and his son had come home. And instead, he was moving on. He was all about starting a big old party. Verses 22 to 24 says, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to be merry. And so they began to celebrate. You know, in that day, they didn't eat a lot of meat and they kept aside the fatted calf for the greatest days. We aren't talking anniversaries or birthdays now. We are talking about the most holy days. That's the only time they'd use this fatted calf. But dad said, today is one of those days. Go and get the fatted calf and we're gonna eat good tonight. Because my son was lost and now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. So he got a robe. What robe was it? His best robe. He put a ring on his finger, which gave him identity. Because rings back in those days used to have like the, the family sign, a little bit like when they, when they use them on scrolls for the wax. He treated his son like royalty because he was found. You know, Jesus was speaking to those tax collectors and those sinners, to you and me. And he wants us to understand what grace really is. Sometimes I don't think we can hardly grasp it. Because grace is this really ridiculous, irrational, free love that it don't depend on you or me one bit. It's all about him. Grace is dependent about isn't dependent, sorry, on what you do, well good you look, well clever you can be. How clever you can become tomorrow. How clever you were. It isn't something you move in and out of. Grace isn't something that depends on you at all. It depends on Jesus. Earlier, I was talking about that £10 note that Phil Focus is. I got a 20 here. Just out of the cash machine. Be honest, it is real. 
would like it. Would like it. Honestly, now, I think we're all millionaires here. If somebody walked up to you saying, no old bad, no, there's no, no, um, no strings attached, there's 20 quid. I can't believe how rich our church is. <laughs> Why are you eating better? <laughs> 20 quid, yeah? No, I don't want it. How many want it now? <laughs> oh, oh, you love it. <laughs> See, the thing is, God wants us to understand it don't matter how filthy, dirty, withered, tattered, beaten, worn around the edges, it don't matter if you're freed, damaged goods, it don't matter what it is. You were worth it to him. Still worth it. That was 20 quid when it came out of the cash pipe just now. And I could I could blow my nose on it, oh. cover it in COVID. <laughs> and I could still go in the shop and get, get changed for 20 quid. It's still it's still there. This is the point I'm trying to make. So to God, you were still worth it. It don't matter what you've been through, it don't matter how bad you've been. Don't matter. This we're talking grace, okay? Don't matter. We still got value. And you and me, no matter what we've gone through in life, no matter what we've done in life, we are still worth it. We still have value. Nothing has changed. And in God's eyes, we are still like the crisp twenty pounds, okay? Tell the person next to you who's still worth it. You can turn around if you want, David. <laughs> okay. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul is right in here and he's speaking to us and he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which when once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of, of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sense of disobedience. We were dead. We were lost. We were dead to him. Spiritually dead to him. There was no saving ourselves. A dead person can't take care of their own deadness. Do you know what I mean? It can't, this can't be done. It's impossible. But then it goes on in verses 4 and 5. But God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Even when you were dead, even when you weren't worth it, even when you hear the story of the prodigal son and go, wow, that's kind of like my story, as I said earlier. Well, that is my story. When you think about your life, and you, and you go, wow, I've had a life where I've rebelled from my family, or I've had a life where I've rebelled from God, or I've had a life where I've rebelled internally from my thoughts, my actions. All these different things God says, no matter what, you were still worth it. Still, God says, my grace is enough. My grace comes to you with open arms with the great covenant of grace, and he says, I love you, and it don't matter what I've done. It's unbelievable, isn't it? You can say amen if you like. It doesn't matter what you will do in the future. I've taken care of it on the cross. My grace is enough for you. You know, we looked at these three stories, and it's kind of interesting. When, when the coin was recovered, or when the sheep was recovered, or when the young son came home, what happened? It was a big old party, wasn't it? In the first two stories, in fact, it said, all of heaven rejoiced. And when God opens our eyes to face him, and we see grace, and we see that even though we are tattered, and a mess, 
we are still worth it. And that Jesus died for us. All heaven rejoices because you are worth it. Yet, there's another audience here, isn't there? So when Jesus is talking to these people, the other audience, in fact, later in the story, we find out that there's another son. And he sits back and he goes, oh, I don't know. And sometimes we can get into that audience, can't we? Like those religious leaders and the other son. We're all kind of thinking, I don't know if grace should be that permissive. I mean, come on. Pretend like allowing them to just do whatever they want. You can't just do that, can you? It's just like giving them a get out the jail free card and letting them just carry on doing what they want to do. And then we get caught just like our older son and we say, well, that ain't fair. I've been pretty good. I might not be perfect, but I've been a good son. I've been a good person. I've gone to church. I give back to the church. I donated to charities. I've done all these things. I might not be perfect, but I haven't gone crazy like him over there. This is where Jesus shakes up our perception and also he starts to help us see that you know that bloke who's, who's quite scary, pretty rough and tattered around the edges and holding up that hungry, homeless side? Or, you know the man who saw in the news last night who, who got a long list of crimes and charges? Or the person who repels you, who offends you always, who drives you nuts and insane? You know those people who live very differently from you and me? You know those people on Facebook who just want to kill? Yeah? You really, really wind you up. You know those people whose morals are totally different to ours? They're still worth it. To God, they are still worth it. Still worth it. Jesus says they're worth it. Just like you, just like me, we've all been there. We are still worth it. And in Ephesians chapter 2 again it says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Meaning, you and me, we are no different from the homeless or the nasty person or the selfish person or the criminal that's out there. We were all dead to sin. And then it goes on, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, that not for yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The God that gave us grace, that could change you and me. You can't earn it, no matter what you do, good or bad, it don't get you into heaven. Only by grace. The God that gave us grace, that could change you and me, he gave us grace to all people. And his grace is sufficient to change anyone, transform anyone. And there's a few of us in here that have been much worse people, not so very long ago, including myself. We stand out on there sometimes, me and Richard. We're out on the door in the morning and there's people walking back, getting their tenor from the lottery or getting their eight cans of strong rope because there's football on this afternoon. And they look at me and they think, one boy even said, he said, I thought he was joking when you started coming to church. It had been eight years now. And, and, I, and he said, I thought, I didn't think churches needed bounces. Not that I'm a big chap, but it was me and Richard on the front. He said, I didn't think churches needed bounces. I said, no. I said, but we are here to get you in, not to kick people out. <laughs> okay? So, grace is this really radical. This grace is amazing and it's over the top. I understand because people think about it and they think, it, it just don't make sense. None of us can fully understand what God is getting at, but I'm glad that there is such a thing as grace, because none of us would be here now without debt. 
is grace that offers to you and to me, everybody and everyone we come into contact with, he offers grace to everyone. There is nobody beyond God's grace. Anyone. As I said, I named all the different types of people in a polite way. People, even now, we've all got people, it's a real tough one to try and forgive everybody that have ever done you wrong. But even them, they're worth it to God. They're worth it. I know there's times that it's hard for us to be like our God, who's this patient God, this Father, who has his arms open wide and he's waiting for us and waiting for us, for people just to turn and make that decision and go to him. And sometimes we struggle to have that kind of patience. But it's our job to point people to that living and forgiving God that we have. It's our job to point them to the grace that we've experienced and we continue to experience on a daily basis. Things me and Max have said to each other over the last couple of months, years, 30 years. I'm glad that there's grace. And I think you hear these people say, I've been married 45 years and we've never had a crossword. <laughs> there you go into hell for lying. <laughs> there is no such thing. But it's all about forgiveness and God's grace. It's our job to help people to know that grace. You know, often the best time for people to know who Jesus Christ is, is when they are in that big field. When they are broken, when their lives are a mess. And they understand that that's scary, isn't it? But many of us don't want to go up there, do we? We don't want to go into that big field amongst them. We want to stay in here, in a holy huddle, in the warm. We don't want to go out and speak to all of them people on the outside who are in a bad place. But what they don't realise out there, that we're in a bad place if you're as well, aren't we? That's why we've got each other. And we're scared when we get near that person whose life is a mess. But our job is to go. There's two thirds of God's name. <laughs> Think about that. It's not to sit here in the church and wait until people come in. That's why loads of churches are closing in the valleys. You'll get two bars on on the fire and put three or four seats all around that fire and just talk to each other, very inwardly facing. And if they turn their chairs 180 degrees and look out and get out, I'm sure that most of those churches would still be thriving. It's our job to go, to invite, talk to people, pray for them, come alongside somebody, so that who's dead can become alive. So that she who's lost is now found. So that they can know that grace that only comes from Jesus Christ and in the process, all heaven rejoices. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've sought me out and my friends that are in this place. That you welcomed us with open arms that with your radical, irrational grace that we can hardly wrap our minds around. Now, Lord, I pray that you help me to turn to others so that they could see that grace that only comes from Jesus Christ. Help me go into the pig fields and into people's lives, even when they're a mess, so that they know the love, the forgiveness, the promises that you offer us each and every day and that they are worth it, and that your grace is sufficient. Amen. Amen.